Hello and welcome back to session 12 of the new creation teaching series in which we are right now. Today we are going to continue with part 2 of the message we started in session 11 which was entitled the inheritance of the new creation and we we uh, talked in session 11 about eight gifts or things that are included in the inheritance of the new creation which are the birthright of the believer in Christ and they were firstly for the gift of no condemnation forever. Secondly, it was sanctification by grace through faith. Thirdly, it was the complete and full authority of the believer over the devil and darkness. Fourth, it was the divine physical healing or health, continuous health. Fifth, raising the dead. Sixth, supernatural uh, peace. Seventh, supernatural joy, and then eighth, supernatural wisdom. And today we are going to continue with two more. There are ten in total. There are more, but we are talking only about ten. The ninth would be divine prosperity and success, victory in every circumstance, in every situation. And the tenth, the last one, freedom from generational curses. So if you're ready today, uh, we are starting with beginning with divine prosperity and success. And when I when I talk about divine prosperity, what I mean is that prosperity understood well. Well, a biblical prosperity it is uh, a gift freely and fully included in the gospel and in Jesus' sacrifice at the cross 2,000 years ago side by side with forgiveness of sins with justification and sanctification I will say it again because this is a powerful and wonderful statement and it's biblical divine prosperity biblical prosperity it is a gift freely given and fully included in the gospel and in Jesus sacrificed from uh, on the cross side by side with forgiveness of sins justification and sanctification why do i put all these free because it's very it's easier for us believers to believe about forgiveness or remission remissions of sins or justification and sanctification and not so easy to believe about the physical healing prosperity and all the other things that we discussed here but they are on the same place they are equal in measure and they are included in the gospel the perfect will of god for the new creation is to prosper in all aspects of life meaning marriage in your marriage in your finances in your job in your business with your children in education in ministry everything that pertains to your life your the your whole world your relationships your everything that that's about you god wants you to prosper and be blessed so divine prosperity biblical prosperity does not include only money although it includes that includes that not only finances and money but more than that way more than that and god wants his perfect will is for you to endure with joy only the suffering of persecution for the sake of Jesus' uh, name. Now, uh, the first biblical text that I prepared for this that supports biblical prosperity, it comes from 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. The context here, if you look the whole chapter, is about finances, is about giving and, uh, and about money, okay, about blessing. So Paul says that, you, that Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, God is rich. Jesus Christ came up from a place of wealth. God is walking on streets of gold and one day we will walk on the streets of gold. God is not poor. He's never poor. And Jesus Christ was rich, yet for our sake he became poor. He didn't really become poor, but he identified with our poverty. In, in, in Hebrew says somewhere that he came in the appearance of the sinful flesh, uh, Romans, sorry. He came in the appearance of sinful flesh to condemn the flesh, to condemn the uh, the flesh but he wasn't sinful he came in the appearance of sinful flesh he identified with the human race in the same way he identified with our poverty so that we so that we through through his poverty might become rich so through the cross he became identified with us but then through him now we can become rich as he was rich and being rich is not a problem having money is not a problem if we didn't have businesses and rich people in the world the poor will die because the poor depend on the rich depend have jobs or, or, on those companies that have the, the big businesses so the problem is not having money the problem is loving money and the biblical prosperity is not only having money, but it means good success in every area of our life and no lack. The will of the Father is for us to be wealthy, to be rich, to have everything that we need. And let's read one more verse for two, from 2 Corinthians 9 verse 8. 
And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. God's will for the believers is to have all sufficiency in all things at all times, so that they would have an abundance for every good deed, so that believers would be able to bless other people, even financially, to, to bless, to sponsor, to do things for God, and, only, and also for them to have everything they need, to not lack anything. That's the will of the Father, to have all sufficiency in all things, at all times and in all places, if I may add. In, in anything, God wants us to prosper. And let's move on and read one more passage from Ephesians 1.3 that talks about spiritual blessings. And I'll talk a little bit more about these spiritual blessings. Uh, let's read what Paul says in Ephesians 1.3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. First of all, let's notice the tenses. He has blessed us. And then with what? Every spiritual blessing. Not a few, not just some, but every, everything. God has already blessed us in, in Christ. Where? In the heavenly places, in the invisible realm. In the spiritual realm, we have all the spiritual blessings as believers. That's our birthright. Now, many Christians today and Bible commentators advocate that in the New Testament, the blessings of the Christians are all spiritual, with double quotation, spiritual only and not physical or tangible. What they mean by spiritual is usually, what they really mean by spiritual is usually symbolic, metaphorical, unknown or mysterious. And they say that only in the Old Testament, the blessings of the people of Israel were physical in nature. Things like abundant crops in agriculture, herds of sheep and camels, servants, fertility in giving birth to children, and health. However, the blessings of the church are only spiritual. Have you heard this idea before? I heard it many times. But we will see if that's, true, if that's the biblical truth or not. People in general have this idea, even the people of the world. That when we talk about spiritual, spiritual with double quotation means unreal, mystical, philosophical, unseen, intangible, unseen, invisible, or without sound. It's something undefined, something not real when we say spiritual most of the time. Now let's see the Greek word used for the word spiritual in Ephesians 1.3 where it talks about spiritual blessings. It's the Greek pneumatikos, where, uh, which is formed from other two Greek words. Uh, the first one is the Greek pneuma, which means spirit. And the, other, the second word is uh, the Greek tikos. Tikos means belonging to, or from, or pertaining to. And in this verse, the phrase spiritual blessing means that the blessing comes from the Holy Spirit. It has the origin in the spiritual realm, is created by the spiritual realm. That is what means spiritual blessing. So any kind of blessing, every blessing that is spiritual, means that it's a blessing created by the spiritual realm, that comes from the spiritual realm. So the spiritual blessings are blessings with properties and characteristics, attributes pertaining to the spiritual world. When, we, when you have a spiritual blessing of health, a pneumaticos of health, it means that the blessing does not depend on the treadmill or how less you eat or how healthy you eat. But it depends only on the Spirit of God by faith. It's realized through the Spirit of God, not through natural means, not through human means. This kind of blessing is not subject to the natural earthly law. It's spiritual, but it's tangible in the same way. You are healthy, but by spirit, not by natural law, by diets, by uh, exercising. When, another example, when you have a spiritual blessing in, a spiritual blessing in finances, that does not depend on how much you've studied or what job you have or how intelligent you are. When, you, when your welfare comes from the spiritual world, it is not affected by the natural roles, uh, laws that's so powerful. Everything that comes from God is eternal in nature. So your health and welfare are eternal. 
And in the invisible realm of the heavenly places that is all around us, Christians are already blessed with every possible blessing that comes from the Spirit of God. Amen? The world can only hope for the best. Isn't that right? The, the, all, the world always hopes for the best, although they are not sure. It's insecure. It's, it's, uh, it's not something certain. People have to work hard and, and sweat and get any, if, to get anything. And even when they manage to get what they want, like a promotion, an increase in salary, a certain position, a car, a house, they have to continue to work as hard to keep it or maintain it. But when it comes to the spiritual blessing, God gives them and He also maintains them. And that is such a good news that we do not work, although we have to go to work, to labor. Our labor is by faith. Our, when we are blessed by God, our blessing does not depend on our sweat or work. And we don't have to sweat or work to maintain it. God maintains by His power. That is so wonderful. I don't know. I am so blessed only when I talk about it. Uh, let's read one more verse about uh, in this context of spiritual blessing and debunk this idea that spiritual means something undefined. Ephesians 5.19 Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spirit. Here Paul talks about being filled with the Spirit. How? Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. Now, what are these spiritual songs? Are they unseen, unreal, without sound or intangible? What do you think? No, they are not. They are spiritual songs, but they are not something undefined. They are songs that come through the Holy Spirit or from the Holy Spirit. Songs usually in tongues. You sing in tongues. You pray in tongues. The same Greek word pneumaticos is used in this passage as well. Songs that come from the Spirit. Another supporting argument for spiritual blessings is that everything we see and feel in this world comes from God. He sustains everything. It comes from the spiritual realm. From nothing, God created the physical world, which is not more real than the spiritual one. God created from the spirit realm the world. So we can say that the world is a spiritual creation because it's created from the spirit. So does, does it make sense? Uh, that the spiritual blessing includes physical blessing only. Uh, the word spirit, the spiritual describes the means of obtaining that blessing, the origin of the blessing. One more passage, 1 Corinthians 15, 44. It talks about the body of Jesus before and after resurrection. Paul says this, It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. And if there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. In this context, the Bible talks about the body of Jesus when He was raised from the dead. It was sown a natural earthly body, physical body and it was raised a spiritual body. Jesus' body after resurrection was a spiritual one. It also talks about spiritual here about spiritual glorified bodies that we will have at the second coming of Jesus. We'll all receive these spiritual bodies, these glorified bodies. We will all receive a glorified body, a spiritual body. The same Greek word pneumaticos is used in the above verse, uh, in, the, in this verse. That means our bodies will, will still have some physicality, but they will be created from the spirit and free of decay. Uh, now let's analyze Jesus' spiritual body after resurrection. In 1 Corinthians 15, 45, the Bible says that Jesus, the last Adam, became a life-giving spirit. Now, did Jesus walk as a ghost? He had a spiritual body. Did he walk as a ghost after resurrection and nobody could see him? Of course not. Even after resurrection with a spiritual body, with being a life-giving spirit, Jesus told Thomas to put his hands on his wounds to see that he was not just a spirit without flesh and bones. He was with flesh and bones. However, his body was a spiritual body. Then later on, he, we see in the Bible that he ate together with the disciple, stayed with them 40 more days and taught them, spoke to them about the kingdom of God. So his body, although he, it was spiritual, he could travel, he could go through walls. It was still physical. It was tangible. It was created from the spirit, but it was tangible. 
All these examples debunk, I believe, I think, and I hope, the idea that a spiritual blessing is not tangible or real. The body of Jesus after resurrection was real, as real as mine, as your body and my body. But it wasn't subject to the natural laws. Amen. It means it could travel even if it didn't eat. It wasn't a problem, but it could eat in the same time. He could disappear and walk through walls. We will all have this kind of spiritual bodies that will never die, that are not subject to sickness and corruption at all. But even the, our current mortal bodies are subject to the Spirit of God. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, they can disappear, be teleported, go through walls and fire. The, we have a, the example of Philip on the road to Gaza in Acts 8.39 when he was taken from the Spirit and uh, uh, taken in the Spirit. Then we have the three young men in the Old Testament who walked unharmed in the furnace. And so even in the Old Testament, we see but physical body, but that, that were not subject to the natural laws by the Spirit of God. So even in our mortal bodies, Romans says that our bodies are quickened by the Holy Spirit. Our mortal bodies are quickened, activated, energized by the Spirit of God. So all the spiritual blessings are included in the eternal life, in our inheritance as new creation that we already received which is included in the nature of the new reborn spirit in our inner man in, of the Christian, in Christ Jesus. And all the facets of the eternal life are actually the descriptions of all the spiritual blessings which only need to be worked out and manifested by us from the spiritual realm into the natural realm by faith, not by our piety, holiness, our amount of prayer, our amount of fasting, but by faith. So in the heavenly places where we as Christians have the same authority and power as Christ, we also have at our disposal already granted by God, already granted by God, every possible spiritual blessing, which includes all physical blessings as well, it includes success, it includes uh, wealth, it includes money, it includes victory, it includes peace, joy, wisdom, all these spiritual blessings. This is way much better than what the people of Israel had where their blessings were based and dependent on their obedience to the law. While our blessings, our prosperity is dependent on Jesus' obedience and sacrifice only, which has already happened. It does not depend on us. Christ is prosperous. You are in Christ. That's why you are prosperous. Christ is rich. That's why we are rich. So there are no other conditions. Our blessings are secure, eternal, and without conditions. And I prepared other references about the biblical prosperity, that which I'll, I'll pick up again in a separate series about prosperity. But uh, in the meantime, you can take, I encourage you to take them personally in your study and study them. Genesis 13 verse 2, Genesis 17 verse 6, chapter 26 verses 12 to 14, Genesis. Genesis 30 verses, verse 43. And again, Genesis 39, verse 2 to 3, it talks about all the fathers of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, how they were prosperous and successful and rich. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 9, verses 11 to 14, and verse 18. And then Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 8. Then we, say, we have Psalm 1, uh, verse 3, on whatever the righteous man, on whatever uh, puts his hands, he prospers. Then Psalm 1, 112, verse 3, Proverbs 8, 18, Proverbs 10, verse 16, 10, uh, verse 22, Proverbs 15, verse 6, Philippians 4, verse 11, and 3 John 1, 2. There are a lot of verses about prosperity. So prosperity is, is the will of God for the new creation. Now let's talk about freedom from generational curses. The last gift that we are sharing, the last gift included in the inheritance of the new creation. And a lot of Christians believe that we're, we're, they can be affected of the sins of their parents or the curses of their parents. And let's start by reading a passage from John 9 verses 1 to 2. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. This is the talking about Jesus. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? So we see in this passage, in, especially in verse nine, uh, in John 9 verse 2, it tells us that the idea of genera generational curses and sin being the cause of sickness 
was very prevalent in Jesus' day. It is the Old Testament mentality. And that was true when people sin, they could be cursed or they could be sick. So disciple, the disciples come with this mentality to Jesus. And for them, it was very natural to ask who sinned, him or his parents. The same way when we put the blame on a sick person today, uh, you might have a hidden sin in your life or you don't have enough faith. The same way disciples came and asked Jesus this question. So obviously the disciples thought that if something like that happened, it had to come from a sin and it had to be either the person or his or her parents that sinned. So the parents could pass down. That's an Old Testament thing. The parents could pass down their sin to their child. That was true in the Old Testament, but it's not true in the New Testament. And that is good news. Uh, that was taught in a few places in the Old Testament, like Exo uh, Exodus 20, verse 5, Exodus 34, verses 6 to 7, uh, Numbers 14, verse uh, 18, Deuteronomy 5, verse 9. All these passages describe the fact that uh, a person could be affected by the sin or curse of their parents or somebody in their lineage uh, uh, from the past. But now we, we need to see that the new creation is free. He is free from any generational curse or sin. Let's open our Bibles at, at Ezekiel chapter 18 verses 1 to 4 and verse 20. Let's read it together. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, What do you mean by using this proverb concerning the land of Israel saying, the fathers eat the sour grapes, but the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, declares the Lord God, you are surely not going to use this proverb in Israel anymore. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the father as well as the soul of the son is mine. The soul who sins shall will die. In other words, the verse 2 says uh, that expression, that proverb that the fathers eat the sour grapes, but the children's teeth are set on age. In other words, means that the fathers do some bad things and children eat, uh, reap the consequences. And God instructs in verse 3, as I live, instructs to not use anymore that proverb in Israel. <laughs> Much more after the cross. So God, even from the Old Testament, it, he says to a point, do not use this proverb anymore in Israel. Because it's, it, it is no longer valid. Everyone from now on will pay for their own sin and not for the sins and curses of their parents. Look in verse 4. The soul of the father as well as the soul of, uh, the, soul of the son is mine. The soul who sins will die. Not the, not the children, not the, it will not pass to the generation as it was in the, old, in, in the beginning in Numbers, in Deuteronomy, the, the references that I already mentioned. Let's see one more passage from Jeremiah related to this. Jeremiah 31 verses 29 to 34. And here God makes through the prophet, Jer through prophet Jeremiah makes a reference to the new creation, to, to, the, to the new creation after the cross. Jeremiah 31 29 to verse uh, 34. But I did, I forgot to, uh, to read Ezekiel 18 20 and it's important. So let's, uh, let's go back. E Ezekiel 18 in the same chapter verse 20. The person who sins will die. The son will not bear the punishment for the father's iniquity, nor will the father bear the punishment for the son's iniquity. The righteousness of the righteous will be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked will be upon himself. So every person God treats individually. By person, per person, not the child will not reap the, uh, his father's sins or iniquities or curses, will not inherit those, and neither the father or the parents will not be punished because of their children. So every person is, is on their own. There are no generational curses, no generational sins passed down for generations. Now let's go to Jeremiah 31 verses 29 to 34. In those days, they will not say again, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on age. Again, this proverb from Ezekiel. But everyone will die for his own iniquity. Each man who eats the sour grapes, his teeth will be set on age. 
Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. Hallelujah. So again, we see this proverb about parents, fathers eating sour grapes, fathers doing bad things, being cursed. And the children still set on edge. And verse 30 says that everyone will die for his own iniquity. Each man, each person who eats the sour grapes, his teeth will be set on and not his children, not his, the generations after him. And then it says in uh, verse 29 says in those days, and that's uh, verse 31 says, behold, days are coming. What are those days that the, the prophet talks about? They are the days, it refers to the days of the new covenant, when that proverb and, and saying will no longer be valid. It, it was not valid even before the cross, but much more in those days. Behold, days are coming, says the Lord, when this proverb is no longer. I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. And that new covenant is the covenant of the blood of Jesus. And with the house of Judah and with the Gentiles, not like the covenant that I made with the fathers in the Old Testament through the law and through the covenant with Abraham. This covenant, these people that uh, the Bible talks in verse 33, here in, the prophet talks in, in verse 33, says, This covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, I will put my law within them. Who are these them? They are the believers in Christ in which God has put his laws, has written the ability to, to do the law, to walk in holiness. I will put my law within them and on their heart I will write it. These are, these are, this is the new creation. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Does it sound familiar, this, this expression? I will be their God and they shall be my people. Who are the people of God? First Peter 2.9 you are the people of God. You are a chosen race. You are a holy nation. So the people of God about which the prophet Jeremiah talks here that they shall be my people. He talks about the new creation, the believers in Christ. And with those, this proverb, this, this, uh, this thing of gener generational curses is no longer valid. The new creation is not subject to generational curses. They are broken. But if you still believe in them, although you are a new creation in Christ, they will have an effect on you. If you still believe in them. So faith, be careful what you believe. But the reality is that you are free from them. And the moment you realize that and you, you say, I am free of generation curse, you become free. The truth will make you free. The, uh, the truth will make you free. So when you realize the truth like you, you do now, when you hear the word of God and you say, I am free of any generational curse, then you become free. That's the reality. And even if you have a sickness or an a hereditary sickness but passed down to you, you can be healed. You have healing in Jesus' stripes. You have healing in, the, in this inheritance. So then nothing can escape. The, the inheritance of God is, is complete. It, it covers everything. Everything that might steal our peace. Everything that might steal our joy. God wants us to be joyful. Full of peace. Full of wisdom. Prosperous. Walking in healing. Walking in health. In victory. Victory after victory. Success after success. And good success. Not illegal success. Not success based on illegal stuff or sinful stuff. But good success. Through, God, through godly means, through spiritual means. Amen? So I hope this will bring freedom to you that anything that uh, you think that might have been passed down to you, you are actually free of those. Don't believe in those. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this, Paul says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature, a completely new creature. The old things have passed, passed away. Behold, perceive. 
that new things have come. All things have become new, including generational curses. So all things like generational curses are things of the past. All things have become new. You are a complete new creation in, uh, fr from your spirit and affects your, sp your soul and your body. Um, and that's about freedom. That's the gift of the freedom from generational curses. And I hope uh, this has blessed you. So uh, in this session today, in session 12, we talked about prosperity a little bit, about spiritual blessings that in the heavenly places, the Christian has every spiritual blessing, including physical blessing, material blessing, finances, everything that is from the spirit and also freedom from generational curses. These are so, such great news that deserve praise. God deserves praise for that. He is worthy, so worthy to be praised and honored. And I, I believe your praise and your worship will be much different now that you found out. Maybe you knew this stuff, but if you didn't know, that I believe that brings such comfort, such, such peace, such joy that we are free, free indeed. If the Son sets you free, you are free indeed of anything that might pull you down, everything that might steal your joy, we are free. Now let's close by memorizing again two verses from this session. The first one comes from 2 Corinthians 9, 8 that I love so much. Let's read it together. It says this, And God is able to make all grace abound to you. I love God. He's, he, he loves this word. I don't know if you notice in the Bible. He loves to use words like all, everything, any. He, he includes everything. He's a rich God. So God is able to make all grace abound to you. So that always, another uh, a word, God word. Always having all sufficiency in everything you may have an abundance for every good deed. I love every, all, always, in all times, in all places, anywhere, any person. That's our God. So He wants you to be blessed. Ephesians 1.3 But let's personalize 2 Corinthians 9.8. We can personalize. And God is able to make all grace abound to me. So that always having all sufficiency in everything, I may have an abundance for every good deed. Praise God. Ephesians 1.3 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Let's personalize it. Blessed be the God and Father of, our, of my Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed me with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the spiritual blessings that you have granted to us. Thank you that you have already given us in the heavenly places everything pertaining to life and godliness, to success, to prosperity, to health, to victory in every circumstance. Thank you that you have made us free of generational curses. You have made us free of curse, of poverty, of failure. We don't fail we, of weakness of condemnation of sickness father we thank you so much that your inheritance the riches of the glory of your inheritance covers everything and nothing is left out thank you father that you are such a rich father such a wonderful father in god thank you for your grace that abounds in us thank you for the holy spirit thank you for teaching us and thank you for building us in faith and we worship you with all our hearts we worship you and thank you and we will forever be grateful to you father we worship you in the name of jesus and by the power of the holy spirit amen until the last until the next session which i probably will be the last one may god bless you and fill you with his spirit with his joy with his wisdom with his peace with his health with his prosperity with blessing every spiritual blessing so that you would be a testimony a powerful testimony and witness of the gospel to all the people amen <music>